Um, 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 okay, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Ooh, this is almost, almost, almost at the end now of um, Unit 5, getting there. I want to do, I think I said I was going to do one more video, but I'm going to split it into two because... Um, because I'm the boss, basically. I'm going to do what I like, I think. Um, but there is a good reason for it. So in this video, I was going to introduce you to the, um, the 5-HT2A receptor. But before I do that, I would like to kind of take a little bit of a step back and try and, try and relate everything we learned in Units 3 and 4 so all of this kind of very high level stuff, you know, cortical columns, interacting, generating world models and that kind of thing, to what we've been learning about in this unit, which is seems like a completely different kind of world away, which is the action of receptors um, uh, in, in individual neurons. So it's a completely different level of organization. Um, but actually, there's a there's a kind of there's a beautiful symmetry in living organisms, and often you, you see one behave you see a behavior that exists at a at a high level, so let's say the entire brain or the cortex, and then you see something a similar kind of behavior going on at a much lower level of organization. Let me explain what I mean by that a little bit. So let's think about what the brain does. So the brain receives information from the environment. Or well, let's think about what the brain evolved to do. You know, the brain really evolved to take in information from the environment, to process that information, and then to make a decision as to the correct next action. You know, the brain was designed, you know, we live, we have an embodied brain. Um, and um, and uh, the purpose of the brain really is to is to guide our actions. And we, we what action we take next um, is depends upon sensory information. So when we see that thing, uh, you know, in the, in the distance there, do we run away from it? Do we run towards it? Do we climb a tree? Do we play dead? Um, you know, these kind of decisions we have to make um, are based upon sensory information. So the, the brain is very good at doing that, and it can do that in, in the most amazingly complex ways. But also a neuron uh, is also doing something quite similar. So a neuron receives information um, from its dendritic tree, it receives all of these postsynaptic potentials, yeah, and then it makes a decision. It processes those um, postsynaptic potentials and makes a decision. Do I fire an action potential myself or do I not fire one? So it's a much simpler decision. It's a much simpler kind of processing, uh, but it's similar to what the brain does. The brain can do much more complex types of processing because it's a much larger and more complex structure that's built from, you know, millions and billions of, of neurons. Um, but often you will see this kind of symmetry. You will see uh, these emergent behaviors. We'll talk about emergent behaviors shortly. Um, you will see these emergent behaviors often at a number of levels uh, of a biological system. Um, and we, we can see a, another kind of symmetry, which I'm going to talk about in this video, um, between this, the kind of world building that the brain does, that the cortex does, these patterns of activation of cortical columns, um, and actually what's going on when a, uh, a ligand binds to a receptor. So, so just briefly, let's kind of just revisit um, how worlds are built. You know, we've, we've been through it now in a lot of detail, so you understand now that your world model is built from the pattern of activation of cortical columns. You've got a very large number uh, of cortical columns that are interacting. They have a pattern of connectivity, uh, and this generates um, this pattern of activity that is your world model. Sensory information comes in. What does sensory information do? Well, sensory information kind of it stimulates this, this ongoing pattern of activity. Um, and, and it, the, this world model has to kind of respond to that. Uh, now, either um, if the sensory information, as we saw, kind of matches the predictions of this world model, uh, then it kind of it extinguishes it. It extinguishes that sensory information. It says, I don't need to know about that. That's fine. I don't need to know about that. And it kind of filters uh, that sensory information out. 
However, if the world model fails to predict the sensory information, then that information fizzes up through this uh, cortical, visual cortical hierarchy to the higher levels of the model, and they have to, and the model has to be kind of updated. And this is going on all the time. So this, the activity of the, the cortex is always responding to and reacting to uh, sensory information. Uh, so how is that related to what's actually going on in individual neurons when ligands bind to receptors? So let's have a look now. Okay, so so this is a kind of a generic um, system with two receptors. Again, it's not important what they are. So we have receptor one and um, receptor two. And then within the um, the inside of the, the cell, we've got this kind of network of molecules. And, you know, we discussed at some length in this unit that these might be, you know, kinases and phosphatases and enzymes. And you kind of understand what these interactions are. You know, this could be, not necessarily, you know, this could be the action of a, a kinase. Um, so perhaps this is activating it by phosphorylating. This here could perhaps be um, a dephosphorylation um, event uh, reaction where this guy is dephosphorylating this one and inactivating it. Could be binding interactions. Again, it's, the details aren't important here. Um, but you, know, you understand now the type of interactions that could be going on in here. Now, even when, let's clear that. Um, so even when the neither of the receptors are occupied by ligands, this, the, this subcellular network of, of molecules, of proteins, uh, is, always, is always kind of exhibiting some kind of pattern of activity. You know, proteins are always activating and inactivating each other or binding and unbinding to each other. So there's always this kind of what we might call a, a subcellular network pattern, if you like, or subcellular uh, pattern of activation. Um, and you will also notice perhaps that these molecules, as I have uh, drawn them in this diagram, look very much like cortical columns. That is deliberate. But they are not cortical columns. They are proteins uh, and other molecules. Uh, but you should appreciate the idea that they, these molecules interact with each other um, and that they generate some kind of pattern of activities with some of the proteins or enzymes being inactive and other ones being active. And we can see that pattern um, um, in this initial condition before any ligands have bound. So what happens next? Let's say, uh, let's take this um, receptor on the left. What happens when a ligand binds? Well, we can kind of understand generally what might happen is you get this... Um, receptor undergoes some conformational change, uh, which is the transmission of information, right? Information across the membrane. And that causes the receptor to interact with uh, proteins inside um, the cell, which causes a new pattern of activity uh, to emerge. So the, the ligand has stimulated uh, the receptor and triggered um, some new pattern of, of information, essentially, some new pattern of uh, subcellular network activity. So in a way, the ligand is acting kind of like sensory information um, to the individual cell. Now, when we look at the other case, uh, so when the second receptor is occupied, it's a different receptor, it interacts with um, a different ligand uh, and it interacts with a different set of proteins inside the cell. So it, it, it elicits a different pattern of activity in, inside the cell uh, that's distinct from the, the pattern of activity elicited by the, um, the first receptor. What about when they're both active together? Well, then we get an, an entirely new pattern of subcellular network activity. Um, the, uh, 
the kind of signaling pathways that receptor one uh, activates interacts with this, the signaling networks that receptor two activates and you get this overall brand new pattern of activity. Um, so, so why do we see this symmetry? Why does there seem to be this parallel between uh, what the, the brain on the whole is doing, you know, the cortex, um, and what's happening at, at the level of uh, individual neurons? Um, and it's to understand it, you, you have to realize that the brain is a complex system. Um, a single cell is also a complex system. So you've got a complex system, uh, lots of complex systems, lots of cells uh, embedded within a larger complex system, which is the brain. Um, what is a complex system? Well, a complex system is not just a really complicated system. Everybody knows the brain is really complicated, uh, but a complex system is kind of it's a little bit special. Normally, a complex system is built from many simple interacting components, often a very, very large number of simple components that interact with each other, often using quite simple rules. Um, for example, the cortex uh, is built from a large number of columns that interact with each other. And through these interactions, you get uh, your world model. Uh, in a single neuron, you've got lots of molecules, thousands of different types of molecules that interact with each other. Uh, you know, through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, binding and unbinding, all these interactions that we that um, that we discussed. Now, complex systems also exhibit what are called emergent behaviors. So, through the often quite simple interactions, but very very large numbers of very very simple interactions between this large number of simple components, you get these emergent properties, emergent behaviors. And an emergent behavior is, or property, is, is a property of, of the whole system that you don't get with um, the components of the system. So there's no way that a single column can construct a model of reality, can, can construct a, uh, a world model, a model of the environment. Whereas all of the columns together interacting can construct this beautiful, elaborate uh, model of the environment that you live within. It's the same with the cell. So, um, you know, the cell has to perform a lot of, of highly complex emergent functions. It has to be able to generate action potentials, um, to maintain ion gradients, to, to replicate DNA, to build and break down proteins, to sort proteins. All of these uh, highly complex functions um, require our basically emergent properties of, of, of this uh, very, very complex network of, of molecules. Uh, a large number of molecules interacting uh, in rather simple ways can generate extremely sophisticated uh, behaviors. So, so when a, a drug uh, enters the brain, it's actually it's, it, it's working at the, the level of single neurons. You know, when LSD, for example, enters the brain, it binds to a receptor. Um, it triggers a change in this pattern of network activity inside the neuron. Uh, and that's not fully understood. We will talk about it. Um, but it's not, it's still a, you know, a topic of ongoing, ongoing research because it is a complex system and complex systems are very, very difficult um, to study. It's very difficult to know what will happen when you stimulate a complex system, when you perturb a complex system, how it's gonna behave. Uh, but that's what these drugs are doing. They bind to the receptor, they trigger this change in uh, network activity uh, inside the cell change in the pattern of activation of all these molecules and this then causes a change in the behavior of the entire cell. We'll look at what that change of behavior is and then remarkably uh, this change in behavior or change in the property of the single cells which are affected by the drug causes this dramatic change in the behavior uh, of the, the higher level system. So in other words, the change in the world model, the change in this emergent property of all these cortical columns. Um, so the drug 
it's a beautiful thing. You know, the drug is was working at this very, very low level, the level of, of single receptors and in single cells, and it's causing this dramatic change in the um, in the activity, of, you know, the global activity of the brain. And to me, it's a, it's a really, really fucking beautiful thing. Oh, choking off a bit. No, I'm not really. Uh, but yeah, it is it is really beautiful, and and it, it it always amazes me. And I think I think a lot of a lot of scientists they uh, they fail to appreciate. They often will work at one level of organisation. Uh, you know, they might do a lot of neuroimaging work or something, and they get very excited about observing these these patterns, changing the patterns of activity of the brain. Um, uh, whereas a pharmacologist might be working in a lab, working on single cells and, and looking at change in patterns of, of molecule activation triggered by these drugs. Uh, but it takes, uh, I think it's, it's really important and really, no, really nice to be able, really nice, yeah, that's the, that's the word. Um, it's really, I don't know, but beautiful, right? Awesome, fantastic, fantastic. It's really fantastic to, to be able to appreciate um, how this, uh, these changes, these changes in patterns of activity that's going on at these lower levels within the single cell can actually can kind of flow upwards and cause these dramatic changes at the level of, of brain and consciousness. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and by the end of this course, you're going to understand that. Um, you're going to understand exactly how that works. Um, okay, so that's, I think, you get the point. Hopefully you get the point. You get the point. Um, so we're going to finish this video. Uh, and then in the next video, I will get back to the kind of the hard science. Uh, and I will, um, in light of having, uh, with this new appreciation of receptors and subcellular network activity, um, I will introduce you to this beautiful serotonin receptor, the 5-HT2A receptor, uh, and, and basically how that works. You know, what is the change in, in subcellular network activity triggered by activation of, uh, of this receptor? Uh, and what effect does that have on the neuron? Um, and then we'll be perfectly fully equipped um, to start thinking about the effects of psychedelic drugs uh, on this receptor and the effects of psychedelic drugs ultimately on uh, global brain activity and on the structure of your world. Wow. Okay. See you soon.